Imagine, if you will, that I just fell out of a plane. Because I'm free. Ba ba da da ba da ba da da ba. Free falling. Disclaimer here. I'm not Tom Petty. This is Chris here. Anyway, so I just fell out of that plane and I'm going to fall faster and 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 faster until I hit the ground. It's a cool story, bruh. But sadly, that is not what would happen. I'm going to teach you all something new today. There's this thing known as terminal velocity. And, wait, let's get me out of the way so we can have a little bit more room to work with, and da 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 Okay, like I was saying, terminal velocity. What is terminal velocity, you ask? Well, it's actually very similar to, you know, a car moving at, say, its maximum speed of 80 miles an hour, and it can't go any faster than that because the engine can't power any faster on its own. It won't go any faster. Unless you want this to happen, in which case the universe is going to collapse and everything and stuff like that. But no, the car's just going to stay at 80 miles an hour and it won't go any faster. Terminal velocity? Very similar concept to that. Say I'm falling and gravity is pulling me down, but the faster I go down, the more air resistance is going to push on me upward, making it kind of like the engine's max speed and I can't go any faster. Now, that isn't to say that I stop falling completely. No, that would be like physics anarchy. I just can't go any faster than I already am. This is what is known as terminal velocity. So, say I'm falling at terminal velocity and we got an anvil behind me. Naturally, with a smaller surface area. And we'll say that it's the same mass as me, for simplicity's sake. And naturally, with a smaller terminal velocity, it's going to fall on top of me. Eventually, it'll exert a force on me as well. So, what happens when this phenomenon happens? Like, I'm already at my terminal velocity and I can't go any faster than that already. So, what gives? What actually would happen to me once that anvil fell on top of me? Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Overanalyzing Random Stuff. And today... We are free-falling into the physics of terminal velocity. Get it? Get it? Free-falling? Terminal velocity? Get it? Man, that was really bad. Okay, take two! Let's try this again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Overanalyzing Random Stuff. Bad puns aside, today we are actually going to be talking about terminal velocity, as you probably already know. I've already mentioned the question. You got me falling at my terminal velocity, and you got an anvil falling behind me. And it presses down on me, but I'm already at my terminal velocity, which means I can't fall any faster, so what happens? Well, to understand terminal velocity completely, we need to know how terminal velocity can be calculated, and... The equation for calculating terminal velocity is this grotesque monstrosity. Ew. Well, the thing is, it's really not that bad. You just have to break it down, and then you can do all of the math very simply. So, obviously, we're going to start with the m. m is the mass of the falling object, in this case, my mass. g, acceleration due to gravity, in this case, Earth's acceleration due to gravity, P, or the Greek small letter rho, the density of the fluid the object is traveling through, in this case it's air, A, the projected area of the object falling perpendicular to the direction falling, in other words, my entire surface area when I'm in skydiver position, and C, the drag coefficient of the falling object. So, let's start filling in some of the easy numbers. M is the mass of the falling object, so what's my mass? 54.4 kilograms, or somewhere around 120 pounds for us Americans. G is the acceleration due to gravity. We know on Earth this number is 9.81 meters per second per second. P is the density of the fluid the object is traveling through. Air is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. A is the projected area of the falling object perpendicular to the direction falling. And believe me, I actually had to measure myself on this one. So, you know, just kind of go along with it with me for a second. Take my word for it, it's 0.75 square meters. And the drag coefficient is very hard to calculate. However, we can use some rough estimates. 
Here's a chart giving the shape effects of drag on most common objects. My falling body is rather similar to this here, a flat plate falling. We're going to give myself the drag coefficient of a flat plate, 1.28. So now all we got to do is plug these into the equation and then solve. The grand total is 94.3 meters per second or somewhere around 210 miles an hour. So that's great, 210 miles an hour. But again, when I'm falling at 210 miles an hour, my terminal velocity, that anvil is going to come up behind me and it's going to press down on me. So what happens? Well... Normally, my mass is 120 pounds, and we know that the kilograms is 54.4. Also, when that anvil comes along, we already said that it's the same weight as me, so that's going to double to 240 pounds. So when the weight doubles, that actually allows the terminal velocity to be a much, much higher number, which means that I can fall to my new terminal velocity at that. My new terminal velocity, redoing the calculations, is somewhere around 132.95 meters per second or somewhere around 297.4 miles per hour, very close to 300 miles an hour. But here's the real question. When that anvil falls off, my mass goes back to 120 pounds. But I'm traveling faster than my terminal velocity already thanks to the lift that, you know, that anvil gave me. So what's the question? Do I just, like, you know, like, not go any faster? Or does, like, the laws of the universe collapse or something? Well, there's three scenarios that came into my mind. Scenario number one, no biggie. I'm already at my terminal velocity from the anvil, and I just go back to my old terminal velocity and gradually slow down to get there. Scenario number two. It's kind of like a sound wave effect, in which case it resonates. In this case, I'll actually go lower than my original terminal velocity, then back to higher, then back to lower, and so on and so forth until it eventually reaches equilibrium, in which case is still my old terminal velocity. And scenario number three, the universe will collapse because the laws of physics have been broken. You know... When I said last, but not least, for the scenarios, but, you know, like, when I said last but not least, maybe least really was the right word to choose. Anyway, we're gonna move on. There's really only two scenarios to consider. The first one, in which case I'll just naturally slow down, and the second one, where I'll just resonate back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until it reaches equilibrium again. But which one is it? The answer may seem obvious at first. It's probably just the first scenario where I'll just, you know, slow down to my old terminal velocity and then that's that. But obviously, when a car is moving forward, it doesn't just stop automatically. No, no, no. No, that's not what happens. A car is like me falling. And the gas pedal is like gravity. So when I let go of the gas pedal, that would mean gravity would be lost. So clearly that doesn't work. And also, where does the anvil fit? The anvil doesn't fit anywhere inside the analogy. So we're just going to have to create a better analogy. A much better analogy is the car strolling along at 60 miles an hour. And then another car comes behind. It's traveling at 75 miles an hour. And it's pushing along the car so it allows the front car to travel a little bit faster. In this case, the front car is me and the back car is like the anvil. And the gas pedal is like gravity. Yep the gas pedal. Anyway, so once that back car goes away and it doesn't push the front car anymore, the speed naturally will just slow down to its old one as the gas pedal is constantly being held and that means it will always, always, always have the force required to keep the car moving at 60 miles an hour, which means I'll never go slower than my terminal velocity. So that's no problemo. Problem solved. But there is a problem, and there's a lot of math required in it, 
And I know, it's the winter break, y'all don't want to do math, so I'll just do it for you. It's addition, don't worry. It's not mind-boggling. So we got 2,000 feet. In case you're wondering what that means, it's when I fall out of that plane, I'll have been falling for 2,000 feet, and then I will have reached my terminal velocity. Falling another 14,500 feet, assuming that they drop the anvil right before I reached my terminal velocity, this is how far I would have fallen once that anvil reaches me. Accelerating to my new terminal velocity will take 7,500 feet of falling, and once that anvil falls off, it'll take 17,500 feet of falling for me to originate in my old terminal velocity, giving us a grand total of 41,500 feet for me falling for this to be realistic. And, of course, I'll have to have time to open my parachute, right? So, we'll tack on an extra 1,000 feet to give me time to open the parachute, giving the grand total at 42,500 feet when I jump out of that plane. And that doesn't seem to be much of a problem, right? I mean, skydivers normally jump out of altitudes like 4,000 feet, and they have no problem at all. Well, no problemo? Well, there is a problemo. So I'm falling out of that plane, right? And we're at 42,000 feet. And the death zone is known to be 26,000 feet. The death zone is actually where there is not enough oxygen to support human life. And I would be falling inside of this period for eh, about 14 seconds. Which is exactly how long my character animation is going to take to drop to that point. Once you cross that point, it starts to become realistic again for human life to be sustained. But the thing is, at that altitude, there's not nearly enough oxygen. Here down at sea level, there's plenty of oxygen in the air surrounding us. But at altitudes of 42,500, and even at only 26,000, O2, you know, the building block of life, Not would, that would just be really bad as there's just not enough oxygen to sustain life anymore. So, what would be the problem with that? Well, there's something known as hypoxia that would happen. And while 14 seconds of exposure of hypoxia definitely is not enough to kill, it is certainly enough to cause you know, shortness of breath, mild nausea, and mass confusion at the same time. And this is just one of the few effects that I'd suffer, and it's one of the least intense. I'd also suffer from high-altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE for short. What this is, is basically pneumonia in a snap. Quick and easy, now at the bargain bargain price of $19.99. What a deal! Oh, wait a minute. Pneumonia is not good. Huh. Anyway, moving right along, I'd also suffer from Hape's similar brother. And basically what they both do combined is that it provides a nice place inside your body to build up fluid. In the case of Hape, it's right inside of the lungs. Slosh slosh is what I put there because there'd be bodily fluids building up all inside the lungs. Well, what about haste or high altitude cerebral edema? I mentioned that they're rather similar, and this is because that, you know, haste is just the same fluid accumulation except inside of the brain. Slosh slosh in the brain. Imagine listening to that all day. Yeah, it would not be good. So, what's the take home message? All of this happening all at once, I probably won't be able to survive. You know, haste and hape are normally actually not that common at 20,000 feet. You know, a lot of people don't even ever experience this at 20,000 feet because only certain people with certain genetic traits are affected by this at a high enough altitude. But, you know, at 40,000 feet? Everybody will suffer. And I do mean everybody. Like, all of y'all. Every single one of ya. Hape and haste symptoms at 40,000 feet. 
Now, lowering the altitude just 30,000 feet actually makes it so that a lot of these symptoms go away from hyperhase, which means that the cruising altitude for planes very similar to this makes it so that the 150 people that fell out of planes and actually survived without any equipment, that's the reason they were able to survive in the first place. Otherwise, they would have suffered from this and died much, much earlier. So, what's the take-home message for all this again? Sure, Albert Einstein would be fine because, you know, no laws of physics would be broken. But, you know, I'd have a lot of fluid accumulation inside of my lungs, meaning that I can't get enough oxygen from the already low oxygen air around me, meaning that I would have a lot of shortness of breath instantly affecting my brain because the small amount of oxygen it can't get, it can't even use because, you know, my brain's drowning inside of its own fluids. And not only that, I'd be, you know, suffering from mass insanity because my brain is drowning and yet it's already suffered from the confusion from the hypoxia. And the icing on the cake? I'd want to puke all while all of this is happening. I'll be in so much pain, there'd be no way I'd be able to open my parachute. So I'd hit the ground, traveling at 210 miles an hour, and I'd plummet to my doom, and I'd essentially die. Man, this was a dark, 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 dark episode. Happy holidays, y'all. <laughs> and that is what I call overanalyzing. Thank you for watching this episode of Overanalyzing Random Stuff. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And if you want to check out the, rem the rest of my videos, I'll leave a link in the description. And if you want to check out my gaming channel that I run with two of my best friends, I'll leave that link in the description as well. This is Chris of Overanalyzing Random Stuff, signing out.